Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I am your host, Zach Bitter, and today I have a guest interview episode for you. Today's guest is Carl Egloff. Carl is an extreme explorer, adventure seeker. I mean, you could probably name him a few different things at this point. He has taken a big interest into chasing FKTs, or what we call fastest known times. And essentially, what those are are routes that are sometimes difficult or impossible to have a race placed there or just very popular routes that people like to go go to and the fkts or fastest known times are just documentation of uh, how you've done it from a speed standpoint relative to others and he's taken on some of the most uh, dangerous iconic ones and has claimed them as the fastest known uh, person to have accomplished them they include efforts on areas like Denali, Elbrus, Aconagua, Kilimanjaro, Makalu. We talk about these attempts, some of the long ones, the short ones, how he kind of structures his training. We talk a bit about his background and how you even get into being able to do stuff like this. And he is actually a mountain guide, which has put him in a pretty unique position to be able to plan, navigate, and manage the logistics for these type of projects. Uh, we talk about cross training as training in general what recon looks like when you're doing a project like this what his interest is in races like the pikes peak marathon or some more formal efforts because a lot of times what we see is people are kind of in the ultra marathon trail running scene and then they do fkts as well uh, carl is maybe a little different in that he's gone reverse he's made his primary focus fkts and he's also now interested in maybe doing a little more racing especially when it comes to getting prepared for some of the projects that he has planned uh, this was a fun one to chat with it was cool to hear about everything that makes carl who he is you know with both of us being ultra marathon runners that was kind of a fun similarity but also being fairly polarized in terms of where our preferred race environments end up being was also kind of fun to hear what it was like from him so that will be today's guest interview if you enjoy this episode want to check it out and support the show you can do that also through the show's patreon page and there you will get early release and ad free audio so advertisements removed i usually put it up as soon as i can after we record it so it's sometimes up there a couple weeks ahead of time when it's released to the regular uh platforms youtube and all the podcast platforms if that's interested to you head over there you can link to it through the show landing page which is just at zackbetter.com forward slash hpo at that page you can also support the show with single one-time donations if you just enjoy a specific episode want to support the show don't like patreon any of those reasons are perfectly fine you have options there to do quick donations and even crypto donations if that's your thing uh, same spot, zachbearer.com forward slash HPO. And another way, if you want to help support the show non-monetarily, there's some great options there as well. If you find an episode you like, uh, like it, share, subscribe to the platform you listen to it on, let your friends, family know where to find it. That sort of thing really helps me grow the show and continue to record episodes. Uh, all right, there we have it. Uh, this episode, Carl Egloff, let's welcome him in. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. Today, I have a rock star guest, uh, Carl Egloff. Thanks for taking some time and coming on the show. Thanks so much, Zach. The privilege is mine. I'm so happy to be with you on the other side of, of the continent, but I'm very happy to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting how we can reach each other so easily nowadays with uh, like Zoom and other recording type devices. So it's uh, what I like to think is like the positive side of technology is we have access to all sorts of motivational people that would maybe be a little harder to come by in previous generations. So uh, I feel very grateful to be able to sit down, chat with someone like yourself and kind of get a glimpse and share with other people a glimpse of kind of what goes through your mind and body when you're doing some of these impressive feats that you've, you've done historically. Thanks you. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Actually, without technology, things would be much harder. And 
it's easier today, so much easier uh, to communicate from all over the world. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Nepal in the middle of the Himalayas talking every night with my son at home. So technology can be amazing. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. And I, I know one of the big topics that we'll be talking about with you is this, uh, this concept of like a fastest known time or what we call in the ultra running community, the outdoor community, Alpine community, if you will, uh, like, like FKTs. So uh, my listening base, there's certainly a lot of endurance athletes who are very familiar with an FKT, but I also have just some fitness folks, nutrition folks that are interested in tuning in that may not know what an FKT or a fastest known time actually is. So maybe if we want to start, if you want to just give us a little bit of a, a preview of like what exactly is an, F, an FKT. Well, FKT is actually the name for uh, records, uh, for the fastest known time uh, that, that there is any registered time, uh, probably climbing or distance or uh, depends where in what sport, in my, in my sport, where I, I dedicate a lot of time, which is uh, speed climbing. Uh, FKTs are mostly, uh, they start with the clients or with the tourists start to climb the mountain until reaching the summit and coming back to the same place you started. That means it would be a round trip time or an acid time. And normally those times uh, are the times I used to train hard for them. Uh, and these are called FKTs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my kind of first exposure to FKTs were sort of, you know, I kind of got familiar with those after I got into ultra marathon running. And my first thought was like, oh, these are kind of cool ways to test routes that are maybe impossible or incredibly difficult to stage a race at. So I think anyone who's done any sort of race directing knows like the amount of permitting and certain regulations where you can't have a certain number of people out there at a time and things like that make it difficult for some of these like historic routes. A, a lot of the ones that you do, I'm sure uh, you just can't really have a race there. So FKTs are the only way to really test who is going fastest up and down or around or however the, the, the specific route is structured. Uh, is, was there something specific about FKTs that was kind of appealing to you when you first decided to start chasing those? Well, definitely there are kind of rules uh, that you, you follow. Uh, for example, if you are doing an FKT on a mountain that, that nobody is pulling you, or uh, for example, if you're doing an 8,000 meter peak that you are not using artificial oxygen, um, there are that kind of rules, of course. Uh, and as you mentioned before, there are, this is a place where you are, you cannot organize a, a race or there cannot start many people on the same time, uh, because of safety, because of, of the environment, because of it's uh, a tough month and, and everything. So normally FKTs are measured time that you do to the summit and you compare it to each other. And this is something that happened a lot on the pandemic that um, there many races could not be done and they started to do virtual races. That means uh, they had the track and you could get, just go out there and, and train hard and do the your best uh, you could. And on the end, this is probably the, the same comparison on the mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of the mountains that you've targeted historically, I can read some of them where you've gotten your fastest known time on are you're the record holder at Makalu, Kilimanjaro, Aconagua, Elbrus, and Denali. And those names, some of them pop up in people's minds, I think, as like very like established, uh, very high, uh, dangerous, uh, a lot of logistics, I'm sure like attempts to kind of go after. And one of the other things that really stuck out to me is what I like to look at when it comes to these longer efforts is just the time it takes to do it. And the spread between those ones I read for you range from 25 hours and 28 minutes all the way down to, was it four hours and 20 minutes for Elbrus? So when I think of just the skill set required to, to race or to perform at a high level, you start getting into like this scenario where people, people tend to be better at certain distances or certain times than others, or they specialize in them. When you're able to hold records from a range of just over four hours up past 25 hours, that's an incredibly large stretch. Is there something like unique about the projects that you look at when you're doing one like Elbrus versus uh, one like Makalu? Well, you just mentioned it. It's uh, so diverse. It's like the running world out there. Then on the end, there are so many different different disciplines. If you are on the track, there are hundreds of disciplines. And uh, 
regarding FKTs on the mountains every single mountain is different. So um, when when I started with with the FKTs, I started in Ecuador where I live, and uh, normally those mountains volcanoes are short volcanoes. You are not uh, gaining a lot of vertical meters and uh, or feet and normally it takes an hour and a half or two hours or two hours and a half to, to do those volcanoes in, in, in a speed version. And, and as soon as you compare it, for example, with Makalu, the last one I did uh, recently, where you are, are out there over 25 hours nonstop, uh, the preparation is absolutely different. Um, I think Elbrus, for example, or Kilimanjaro, those mountains are much more in athletics mountains. That means you have to be uh, very fast on trail running. You are measuring your time um, regarding every mile or every kilometer that you are running. Um, you, you are always checking your pulse. You're always checking that you don't forget to drink. And uh, But your performance is much more uh, an athletic performance. And if you compare it, for example, with Denali or if, with Aconcagua or right now with recently with Makalu, it's different. You, are go- you know they are going to be there probably 15 hours out there and or more. So it, it's kind of an ultra run that you will that you are very specialized, that you have just to keep the pace and try to never forget to eat and um, focus very much on your pulse. And the progression on the mountain is also getting colder and colder and colder. So you are putting more layers and more layers and more layers. And then on the way down, you are leaving those layers or taking them off and putting them on a backpack. So it's absolutely a different strategy. You attack those short mountains with probably just one pair of shoes and the big mountains with different um, different gears, different shoes, different mountain boots. So um, I always compare it that every single FKT that I do is, is like building a house. You have to see how it has to, yeah, how you have to build it in the, in the next months and, and, and what, is, what are the challenges, what are the weathers, uh, the weather like, how much time do we have and everything. You just have to, check every detail so on the end the house is standing there and the fkt is also like this on on a on an f for example the last fkt i did on makalu uh, you you have a lot of rules regarding altitude very dangerous altitude you don't you don't want to arrive on that very dangerous that zone or over eight thousand meter peak mountain at night for example so you you all are planning all this logistics that you arrive to the to the death zone on a certain time of the day that you can recover that you are not risking too much and coming down also in a very good time of the day so there is a lot of planning behind where normally people believe when they read those things like this guy just run up the mountain and down uh, there is a lot of respect behind, and there is also a lot, of, a lot of um, training behind. That means you you probably climbed that mountain many many times before you are talking about an FKT or or attempting an FKT. There is a uh, a lot of of hours on altitude and sleeping on tents and and doing some performance before just going out there and chasing the record. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and with like a route like Makalu since it is such a longer effort are you're you're heading out there i would imagine like well before your attempt and are you practicing like different segments that in, in isolation from one another so you're like familiar with the route but just not tackling it all at once absolutely uh probably not the lastest part because um on the end, the last part is on the dead zone and you are not going to recover fast and everything. But I think 80% of the road, you're going to definitely check it out at least once. And um, you have also to figure out what helps you with nutrition up there. If, if uh, it's in different altitude, if, if you are sleeping in tents, also how recovered or, or how uh, tired are you next day when you wake up and everything so it, it takes some time for example in Makalu before the record day we were 30 days already uh, in, at the Himalayas it means we we have been training and and sleeping in altitude we did two or three different rotations to the altitude we touched the 8,000 meter border and we came back and then we did of course you have to decide with weather forecast which 
date is going to be kind of the best one to do it. And uh, this is something that is uh, absolutely different to other FKTs. If you do them in a lower section or in Kilimanjaro or in lower mountains, you, you don't care that much about weather forecast because the weather is not going to be dangerous. But on, on such a mountain, it's, it's, it, can, it can be absolutely game changing. Uh, uh, it can be really uh, dangerous to be out there with wind conditions and strong, strong uh, dusts and everything. So you have to plan and sometimes the planning um, gets wrong because you are waiting too short and you do not recover well and there is a, a good window to do it or or the other side that bad weather is coming in and you are losing your your acclimatization you're waiting out there in base camp for 10 days and you're getting kind of impatient and this is something that it's part of the game too mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes it really interesting because I think like when I look at the ultra marathons I do, there's such a like kind of a controllable element to it because so much of it is controllable from even sometimes the weather. I've done indoor like track races and things like that. And uh, there's aid stations and food availability whenever you want it. And you kind of eliminate some of those hurdles and you're on the opposite of the spectrum where all those things are kind of part of the project itself. So have you done an FKT before where you've just had to like simply bail out on it because weather came in at a different time than you expected it to, or just never even got off a of base camp because of the forecast never cleared up the way you wanted it to? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I went uh, the first time to Denali 2018 and uh, we went up to the summit to acclimatize, to kind of check out the road. And when we came back to base camp, we decided to wait for the, be for the best day and that day never came. And uh, I was getting impatient and I said, okay, there, we don't have that much food anymore. Um, I, should, I should really check if there is a, a short window to do it. And, um, and then I said, okay, I'm going to start and I'm going to see if this short window is going to work out. And half the month then I had to turn around. Uh, there was uh, too much avalanche risk. And uh, uh, on the end, I said, it's too risky. Let's, let's, yeah, let's go back. And of course, um, you are tired, you don't recover that fast. It's absolutely different if you are at sea level and you do something like that instead of being so high that on the end, your body, your muscles, they need much more time to recover. You need much more sleep to recover. So sometimes it's, uh, it's very important to be patient because if you are impatient, you can miss the perfect day because you are not in conditions to do it. So it's, it's always, I'm, I'm happy I'm not 20 anymore because if I would be 20, probably I would be much more impatient. And with 40, you are, I think, a little bit smarter. Uh, I don't know if faster, but smarter, definitely. Yeah, it's re really interesting. You, you highlighted a couple of things that I was going to ask you questions about. One is just like kind of the age that, that these type of things tend to be like the sweet spot. I think we look at, you know, some of the more like well-known, like popular sports, there tends to be an age range where we assume people are going to peak at, and then they may be able to hold on to that peak for, you know, a certain amount of year, some longer than others. And then there's a kind of a drop off at a certain point. And with ultra running, it always seemed to me when I first got into the sport that it trended a little bit older. And then I think as the sport got a little more popular, we started seeing younger folks come in and break records and stuff. And I was like, well, maybe it's going to kind of level out a little bit as we see more youth come into the sport. And then the last couple of years, uh, I mean, we've had like examples of like uh, the women's 24 hour and hundred mile world records getting broken by a 40 year old, uh, the men's as well, same thing. And actually hundred K up to 24 hours is now held all by a 40 year old. And uh, I always just wonder like, where is that kind of peak age where you have that natural balance of enough experience to know what you're doing and be able to troubleshoot when problems arise, but still young enough and enough spring in your legs so that you're getting up and down the mountains in your case as quickly as you could when you were maybe a little bit younger yet too. Have you given that much thought or have you just more like, Hey, these are the projects I want to do. I'm going to see what I can get out of it. And whatever that time ends up being is, is what it ends up being. No, absolutely. I agree with you with all what you said right now, that depends the sport. It depends also where you train, how hard you train and um, what kind of goals are you, are you chasing? Of course there are, 
so many different uh, things. If we talk about FKTs, there are mountains there. You have to be like so fast. And, and, and for example, to put one in an, an example, uh, Mont Blanc, for example, that everyone is training on the mountain uh, in, in France. And there is uh, a lot of, of the scene, of the trail running scene, UTMB and all these races around the mountain. So many people are going up and down. So the, the record is very tough to beat. And uh, it, it has become really a kind of a, an athletic record um, versus mountains that nobody goes because uh, it's so difficult to reach them. For example, uh, Vincent Massif in the Antarctic that probably the FKT has never been done uh, in an in athletic version. So um, I think that I think the age is uh, absolutely important, um, but I'm really happy uh, not to be too young because uh, right now I have my values to, to come back home. I have my family. I know where, where I can push and where I have to go back. Of course, when we are, I'm 41, uh, I would, sometimes I, there are days that I would love to be 20 again and uh, recover fast. And after coming down from the mountain, normally I, takes probably double as time as a 20 year old to recover your muscles and, and sleep well and, and, and drink well and everything. Uh, but on the end, what matters to keep you alive on those things is, is your experience. So I'm happy to be 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. The other, the other thing I was going to ask you about with kind of the range of times or distances that you've done with these things is the actual like nutritional component of these projects uh, I'm assuming it's basically self-supported where you're carrying everything you need to eat and drink, or are you melting snow and stuff in some cases for water? Well, it has happened, but normally, normally it can't happen. I mean, you, you take everything with you. You, you don't want to lose time. And uh, if you know there is someone on the mountain that day, there is um, going to give you water or give you food because they are already tenting there. It helps you to, to carry less. Uh, but normally... Some, some of the mountains, they are, yeah, absolutely, there is nobody out there. So you take everything with you. And uh, regarding nutrition, I, it's, it's always um, very related with the altitude. Uh, there are mountains that you can really push hard with power food, with power gels, with power bars and, and, and gums and everything. And there are other mountains there. For example, right now, I, I, I had a lot of trouble with my stomach on Makalu. Uh, because I had so much, uh, yeah, my headache was exploding with, with the altitude and everything. So I was drinking paracetamol, for example, on the way down and, and combining it with power food, everything came out. And uh, it, it, it takes you all the energy out and then you, you need more water, you have to stop more, you have those, those moments that you have really to stop and drink something. I had to stop and drink a soup. In, in, in camp two because I, I was I could I did not find any energy I could not even eat anything else than just uh, what I had on my backpack so I, I needed real food and um, this kind of things are so important to have experience that means that um, you have done something similar on similar altitudes on similar latitudes like uh, how your body is reacting and and what happens if you are drinking yeah an Advil because you have a headache or whatever, what happens with your body, with your, with, uh, and also being 35 year, days on base camp uh, at 6,000 meters altitude, like what you need to not lose muscles and, and keep fit and uh, have the energy. I, for example, I, I lost, uh, yeah, kind of five pounds in base camp, even trying to eat as much as I could. But yeah, even like that, you cannot eat enough and uh, your body is, is, is not hungry enough. So uh, it's always, for me, like experience is everything on this board that to know what you need for the next time to make it better, to try new things, of course, um, probably not drinking or eating any power food uh, for, for the very big ones and just make a 15-minute break in, in, a, in a tent and eat something yeah, or like real food and uh, like ultramarathon, I think it's, it's very similar uh, to kind of understand your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as the distance gets longer or the time gets longer, you start to kind of switch from maybe some more engineered sports products to more solid food options uh, in order to kind of ease that stomach distress that could potentially happen from trying to digest all that stuff. Uh, 
Is there uh, and yeah, and I would agree that's very common. I think like one of the strategies I really like when you start getting into longer ultras is if you're going to be using sports products or like power foods, like you mentioned, have that kind of a balance where you're having that some of the time, but you're also rotating in some solid food options. I've always found that that just helps kind of ease the digestion a little bit and, and keep things moving in the right direction a little better than if you're just taking in like purely liquid calories or the goose and the gel type type products all the time. Absolutely. I agree with you. It depends uh, how many hours are you going to be out there. And then uh, it, it's also very important what you're drinking. If you are drinking just water or you're mixing water with powders and um, how often are you eating something solid? And um, of course you can ne never forget to uh, yeah, drink or eat enough uh, salt and minerals because um, your muscles are going to definitely feel it and your stomach too. This is probably what happened to me and Makalo on the way down that I was eating too, too many sweets, sweet things. And uh, this is probably why my stomach started to, yeah, to strike a bit. But um, yeah, this, these things are good for me. I can learn from those things much more than if I read them. If that really happened to me, this is perfect. So my body knows that next time I have to do it better, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you target a certain amount of fuel per hour when you're out there for those longer sessions? Or is it more just like, I'm just going to try to get in what I can. And, and I don't, I don't want to say hope for the best because you're, I mean, your life is essentially at risk at this, but you know, you there's, like you said, there's, there's times where things are going better than others with nutrition and your ability to digest stuff. But is there like a target range you're trying to hit when you're out there for that long? This is a great question because on the end, if you're doing an ultra marathon or if you're doing a marathon or you're doing a bike race, you know how many calories you're going to lose for per hour or approximately. In this kind of sport, you don't know because um, it's always related with the altitude, mm -hmm. with the vertical gain and also how your body is reacting about coldness. So uh, it's always a thing of every time I remember that I have to eat, I eat something and uh, I try to change a little bit. I, 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 I have different things in my jacket, so I'm, I'm mixing a little bit, but normally it's a rule of 20 minutes uh, per next. Also every 20 minutes I have to put an alarm and I know that it's time to eat something. Uh, I cannot miss this window because afterwards if, if i miss one or two windows you're definitely going to feel it later mm -hmm. and do you how much extra weight do you end up carrying just with like the logistics of you, i know you can probably pick re, like restock at the different camps along the way to some degree but you must be carrying a fairly big like pack or your pockets are essentially full or something like that absolutely because also uh, not just nutrition, it's also about security. On the end, I take a lot of layers with me. I take extra mittens, I, I take an extra harness, I take extra uh, sunglasses, I take many things because I'm a guide. So I always think how the scenario can change on the mountains and it, yeah, it can be really challenging if it changed. So I always think about those things. I have also an in reach I have. So normally I have 15 to 20 pounds backpack. Uh, with me with food with uh, enough uh, water I have sometimes also coca-colas in my backpack uh, it, depending what how long it, is it going to take and of course you plan to kind of refill on the different camps but sometimes this does not happen and once I had an, an FKT on, on Kilimanjaro and I was waiting for my team on camp four and they never arrived and uh, I could not continue because I did not have nothing else to eat or to, or, or, or to drink. We planned to, to meet there and fill everything. And I did, they never arrived to that place. So actually, since then, I learned to be absolutely autosufficient. That means if they are not arriving or if you, you miss it or if you are running in the fog and you cannot find it, uh, that you're, you, you don't have to stop your FKT because of that. So uh, it's better to take some more pounds with you instead of yeah, missing something very crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just seems like the logistics are at a whole nother level. And when you're, when, you, when it's a little more risky like that, it just becomes a little more tight margins, I would say. 
so like you mentioned you have a background as a guide. And I, I do want to kind of get into your background a little bit and dig into a little bit about how you got into, you know, this type of an activity and like what like sports or activities got you interested or led you to this. Cause I always find, find it interesting that it's pretty rare that I see someone doing what you're doing. And that that was just something they were doing when they were a kid, it, it may be something similar, but probably not anywhere near the capacity that you're doing it now. So like you had a background or you, you're, you're currently a guide right now too, right? Yes. 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 Actually I do that for a living. Okay. Like how valuable, I'm sure it's incredibly valuable, but like, does that give you opportunities essentially to really do a lot of recon on some of these routes because you're guiding people up and down these efforts at a more, what I guess you'd call like a pedestrian pace? Yes, absolutely. It depends. Of course you are not guiding every day um, in, in, in the seven summits or in the, in the mountains that you have the project, but normally where, as I started as an athlete, um, it was very expensive to finance the different trips. So sometimes I was just guiding, taking my clients to those places and then uh, finding a free time in between of, of, of their rest days to train or to go up to the summit and kind of check out the road. And as soon as they left, uh, when they returned to their country, I, I stayed for two or three days longer and tried an FKT. This is how everything started, actually. Uh, so I always saw these opportunities of guiding to finance my trips. Uh, today things changed. Um, today I, yeah, I, 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 if I guide too much, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely tired. So if you are guiding two or three or four months in a row, you definitely yeah, are not in shape anymore to do FKTs. So it's always the, the most important thing for me is having this balance. That means I use guiding today to acclimatize i use that i start my my year normally very high on mountains guiding aconcaguas for example sleeping in altitude and everything and as i I see it as a training i i I love to guide i still love to guide and um but of course when i return i focus on my fkts and I, i stop guiding for a couple of weeks or months just to be very fit to gain velocity to to be fast on the mountains and I, I switch during my entire year between guiding and projects because I cannot kind of uh, mix them together too much anymore. It's difficult for me right now. Many people say, okay, Car, could you guide us tomorrow? And, and you have a planning. You have um, absolutely a training planning for the next weeks and so on. So it's, uh, it's definitely a huge plus. Uh, I think uh, you know how to approach a mountain. You know how technical things are, are be, has, have to be done on the mountains. And I'm happy to have that background because normally there are runners who discover the mountains and sometimes they skip certain steps uh, like the acclimatization or the technical part or the gear or those things. And in my case, I'm a mountain guide who discovered uh, trail running so on the end for me it was much more a challenge to be a fast athlete instead of being in the mountains in a tough terrain so i'm happy to have that background so this is good for me sometimes to take the decisions in where where to stop or turn around or yeah how how it has to be done another great way to support the human performance outliers podcast is through the show sponsors If one of the show sponsors has a product you're interested in trying out, you can let them know that you support this podcast by ordering through here. You can find all the show sponsors' details, links, and discounts at the show sponsor landing page, which is zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors, as well as in the show notes of every episode. This episode's sponsors include Optimal Carnivore. Optimal Carnivore knows that organ meats are some of the most nutrient-dense products on the planet, so Optimal Carnivore has shared with us their beef liver, organ meat, and bone marrow products in the past, but want to let you know about the new addition to their lineup. It is a nootropic called Brain Nourish. Nootropics can potentially boost overall brain function, focus, and productivity. Optimal Carnivore includes lion's mane's mushrooms and grass-fed beef brain. Each serving has 1,500 milligrams of 100% organic lion's mane mushroom and 1,500 milligrams of beef brain sourced from the highest quality regenerative farms in New Zealand. 
If you would like to give Brain Nourish or any of Optimal Carnivore products a try, they will plant a tree for every product sold. Simply head over to Amazon.com forward slash Optimal Carnivore and use the code HUMANSAVE10, that's HUMANSAVE10, to receive 10% off your next order. Also, my friends at Element Electrolytes, Element makes an electrolyte supplement with no sugar. Each packet is loaded with 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. They come in convenient single-serve packets that make them great for bringing along for a run, hike, to the gym, or while traveling. My go-tos are their citrus flavor during long runs and their chocolate flavor in the morning with my coffee. If you are hesitant or would like to try out Element first before you purchase it, they are offering a flavor sample pack with one of each of their flavors for free to anyone who uses the HPO URL. If you want to check them out and support HP along the way, you can head over to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO. And the free sample pack is good for both new and returning customers. So take advantage of that and try out each of their flavors now. I think that's just super interesting because it almost seems like as an outsider looking in that like the guiding almost serves as kind of like a foundational or base fitness that you can get. And then also sort of probably a problem solving opportunity where you're able to kind of see different situations and scenarios on these routes in a lot slower pace, a little more controlled pace. So then when you have those things occur, when you're doing an FKT, you maybe have a little bit more of a, of a list of things in the back of your head of like how you'd maybe navigate that situation is that how you, you kind of look at it with that? You have some foundational fitness from the guiding, but then ultimately when it comes time to picking a project, you need to get very specific with what you'll be doing during the project in order to be fit enough to be able to do it the way you want to. Yeah, I think are definitely to have a job that you are out there all the time. First of all, altitude. Secondly, you are walking many, many, many hours, but this is the point. You are walking many, many hours in a very low pulse. Mm -hmm. So normally you are kind of freezing also. You are wearing much more layers. And as soon as that you have to kind of focus on your training, you, you are out of breath because you are not used to be so fast again. So I always use the guiding as, as a good time of the year to acclimatize to win uh, red blood cells in my body, to take it easy, to have more passive training. And then uh, I have to really radically stop and uh, focus on, on pace. Uh, and this pace is normally made where I live uh, on lower altitude. It's still very high altitude. It's still like Leadville altitude, Colorado altitude, but uh, this is my lowest altitude that we have here around. And this is where I normally perform. This is where I compete. I do a lot of trail running events. I, I normally choose uh, short distances so I can really struggle a lot in, 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 in pulse, in, in mentally and everything. And, uh, and then I'm always switching between mountains, uh, training projects and guiding. This is something that uh, in the last three years went pretty good, actually very good because uh, we can, I can really... Uh, check my my time and see where I'm able to guide. I I, uh, I have my clients waiting for me uh, many months, and I said, okay, perfectly, let's go then. And this is a good month to climb the mountain, and so I can choose the projects that I can do the rest of the year, and it works pretty good. Of course, I can't do FKTs the rest of my life. I'm definitely gonna be older one day, and. Uh, uh, I definitely don't want to risk anymore uh, too much as soon as I end my projects and everything. So definitely there will be different times in, in a near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you decide, okay, it's time to really start peaking for a project, you have a project kind of in the back of your mind as something that you're going to target and you start working on kind of the specifics for preparing for that and maybe stepping away from guiding for a little bit. You like to use trail races to kind of to test your fitness or also develop your fitness along the way you're using those as kind of like benchmarks and training tools to get you to where you want to be for the fkts yes sir. absolutely uh it's something that i need i'm a very competitive person so for me it's important to yeah to see how i am um 
compared with the others and uh, not just virtually or checking what they have done so far. So for me, it's important to race, to see how my body is doing and, and different distances. And, uh, and normally I do also certain parts of the FKT that I'm, I want to do uh, to see in certain places where I have to get better or where I can take more time or which kind of preparation is what, what I need. For example, just to put something on the table, the next one I'm going to do is Karsten's Pyramid. And Karsten's Pyramid in Indonesia is a rock climbing mountain. So it's uh, completely something different that I have done so far. It's, it has nothing to do with running. It's uh, really scrambling and scrambling fast. So um, it's a completely another preparation. Right now I'm starting with gym. I have to win some weight. I have to do some push-ups. Uh, I have to climb. I have to uh, do another preparation. And this is something that I, that I really love because if you are out of your comfort zone is where you really, really have to struggle. And, and this is what's all about, about the seven summits. And it's so what, what I like the most about this, this sport, because it's not just that you are trying to be better in, in, in one mountain and then keep your entire life doing in, it in the same mountain. It's always another place. It's an, another weather, another temperature, another terrain, another skills. And this is, um, this is something that I really enjoy. So I, I don't get bored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just think it's fascinating because it's like you almost add an element to what otherwise would be a lot more of a lower body exercise to like in some of these projects, like the one you just mentioned, you have an upper body component where you can't be weak there either. And I'm curious, just like what role strength training plays in general with these type of pursuits. Is that something you are very like meticulous about in terms of doing certain movements in the gym to prepare your body for these type of things? Or does that change drastically based on the event itself too? Well, in this, in this occasion with Carson's pyramid, uh, it, it, it's going to be like kind of the first one I do it with rock climbing. So it's very new, everything for me. Uh, of course, I have a, a rock climbing background because I'm a mountain guide and we have to, to keep climbing all the time. We have sometimes uh, climbing clients. So um, you have to be out there. You have to, to be in a certain level to guide also internationally. So it's not that it's absolutely something new. It's just that I have to take much more time uh, and, 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 and yeah, split more this, uh, this uh, long distance running into also fitness training. I'm definitely going to yeah, boulder two, three times a week uh, indoor. In, in, in pro I have in, at my home, I have a, a small gym. Uh, I can climb in my garage. So this is going to help me definitely to, to win some, some uh, muscles and also some strength. And then definitely combined with, uh, with gym. Uh, I think uh, there are very important exercises like back or lower back or shoulders that you have to take care of because you're probably going to carry also a small backpack with you. And, and what, what makes you, what hurts you really on, on this kind of things is the descent. The descent is look is so fast that uh, normally when I run down a mountain, I, I, I always struggle three, four days with my back. So this is something that I, I have to take care of all the time in the gym or at home or doing some, yeah, so some functional training at home. This is something very important as a runner too, as a, as a trail runner too, you have to take care about your back and your shoulders and your upper body. Even if you sometimes think that you are not using it, you are using it much more than you think. No doubt. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I love that. Uh, you know, one other thing I wanted to ask you about just is, kind of highlights the well-roundedness perhaps of like what you, you end up actually doing is even though you maybe took a little bit of a different path to it, you do do trail races and other, you know, things outside of the FKTs. And, you know, one of the notable ones that I saw when I was kind of looking into some of your accomplishments was your Pike Peaks marathon race where you ran three hours and 48 minutes. And for folks that think, if you're thinking, if you're unfamiliar with Pike's Peak marathon, it's not your average big city marathon, there's a fair bit of altitude. There is a fair bit. Uh, I shouldn't say a fair bit, a lot of climbing, a lot of technicality to it. 348 is a stellar time for that route. Uh, for some perspective, I think Killen journey ran 340 there a couple of years ago when he went, uh, is that something you would like to do again, or those type of events, something that you're going to target a little bit more now that you're, uh, have checked some of these FKTs off the list. 
absolutely i would love to do it more uh time is always the question mm. and focusing on something but definitely definitely on 2019 i i focused an entire year um on trail running i was uh actually i was raising the entire golden trail series uh, worldwide uh, for ecuador and um I was placed on the end of the year, the top 25, uh, racing the, all these short distance races. Well, short distance is always like, okay, it's still three, four hour races. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> But this is still considered short running, short distance racing, but definitely against the top of the world, like Kilian Jornet or Stage Kennedy in the States or uh, Max King in the States, or yeah, there are so many out there. They are doing, doing this, it raises in, in an amazing time. Um, and definitely, definitely in Ecuador, I, I race normally five to 10 races a year. Uh, those kind of races to keep fit, to keep focused. But I have in Ecuador, we say you have to choose your wars. Mm -hmm. And uh, my war are the FKTs, and uh, I, I'm not 30 or 20 anymore. So I decided to really focus on this FKTs and on the way. Uh, on my preparation, on on my training, uh, choose certain races to measure myself and um, yeah, and still have fun out there. But definitely, if I would not have this FKTs in my mind or in any projects, I would be hundred percent focused on trail running today internationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting to me because I think like when when I'm honest with myself, if you, I feel like from just performing at your absolute best where you just really wring yourself dry and like hit it on the head with a race of the length and duration that you're doing. I always find you can maybe do like two, possibly three of those per year uh, before things start getting a little unsustainable. So then you, you can add those other races like you do, but they have to be, you have to like let your ego drop a little bit and commit to say, maybe I'm just going to push 80% of what I could probably do optimally if I spent like four months preparing for this specific, this specific trail or this specific race or something like that. So it sounds like that's kind of where, where your mind is at. I want to pick these FKTs as my big, I'm going to like leave every last ounce of my energy out there. And then I'm going to use these trail races as ways to kind of perfect my fitness for that particular endeavor. Uh, is that kind of the way you look at it from a frequency standpoint, or is there more or less of these FKTs you feel like you can do in a calendar year? You just resumed it perfectly. It's exactly like that because on the end you can choose many beautiful races that you have always have in your bucket list and, and uh, just go out there with no in, uh, kind of inspiration to win them that just, um, just go out there and have fun and just uh, kind of, yeah, uh, as you said, put your ego away and, and do it as, as training. But sometimes I always see myself like if I'm not raising fully or focused, I prefer to stay with my family and do something else uh, because I'm very competitive and I probably, uh, yeah, I just want to perform 100%. This is why in the last two years, I I did not start any international trail running races again because i said okay i just have to focus on on these fkts and um, just use my local races that are not taking me a lot of energy away but definitely there are many races that i still have in my bucket list that i would love to race for example uh, yeah hard rock 100 in the states for example or come back to pikes peak and try to be their top five or um, go back to Segama in, in, in Spain, which is uh, probably one of the most famous races worldwide. There are so many races that I would love to, and probably I will come back to all of those as soon as the project is over, as I'm going to really focus on, on finishing the seven summits in FKT. Uh, three, three are left, and Everest is uh, just around the corner, and with Everest, I would be closing this project. So definitely it is a big possibility that I'm returning to uh, a good level of, of trail running as soon as the, the project is over and switch my mind in something else, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Everest is the final of the seven summits that you, you have on the, on the project list. Yes. Well, if everything goes 
good and plan and we can continue with the plan uh i would be going this year to carson's pyramid uh then in january to vincent massive and then in uh, may next year i would finish the seven summits with uh with everest right now we are holding four of the seven summits so the three that i just mentioned are the three left and um yeah this is kind of the plan right now so in less than a year i would love to be ending the project exactly on those on this dates excellent yeah that'll well that'll give you three fkts in a calendar year there you have it <laughs> um the, so with with everest i feel like that one probably has its own unique set of challenges being that it's you know mount everest but also just its relative popularity so what kind of planning do you have to do differently for that one in simply just to navigate the amount of kind of traffic out there. Cause now there's so many people that are just summiting Everest uh, when it's open, I would imagine that that does that, does that become an issue where you get kind of bottlenecked back behind and you can't necessarily move at the pace you want to, or is there a way where you can kind of get a clean shot at it without having to kind of manage your way through traffic, so to speak? Well, this is a great question because uh, we are talking about traffic. We are not tra talking about all the all the difficulty of the mountain and the altitude and everything. And this is exactly what it's all about on Everest. That means uh, everyone is talking about the quantity of people, even myself, uh, how I'm going to manage to do it. But on the end, I cannot forget it's a dangerous mountain without oxygen on that altitude. And you are you don't want to be stopping and overpassing people or just uh, kind of waiting under the ladder to just climb it. Or So you have to be very smart and very patient. Uh, first of all, Everest has two sides. That's like the south side and the north side. The north side has been closed for... Uh, pandemic reasons and political reasons for the last three years. And uh, we are planning next year uh, to, yeah, just, just to climb Everest uh, on the north side. So we are really expecting China to open the north side again. Uh, and why? Because uh, you have probably there 80, 80 to 100 climbers instead of 300 to 500. So it's absolutely a, a, a big, big difference. And uh, it's probably a more technical mountain, but this is not uh, this is not an issue for me. For me, it's much more an issue the people and uh, the, the yeah the traffic jam and everything. And something that it's very important that we just figure out right now also in Makalu uh, that you have to you have to wait until the last people climb the mountain, and sometimes the few days after you still have amazing weather and nobody's on the mountain so is exactly the point where you want to be there because the path is made uh, everything is yeah a kind of a freeway up there and nobody is out there because normally people summits uh, on this date uh, 24th to 26th like the latest and then they start to descend because everyone has to go out before end of may from everest because of permits so uh, i can choose a day that people are coming down the mountain to do it in one day and i i'm still coming down as as predicted before the season is over so something like that you have to be like really smart on taking these decisions or 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 really checking the weather forecast and everything but with 80 people compared with 500 on the other side it's much more manageable yeah, no doubt. I can imagine that would be a big relief to know that you're going to have less, less of those hurdles to have to try to manage, which are, you know, as, as much things are probably like unpredictable and you don't want to have to have that eating away at your psyche. Cause you know, a full day of, uh, going up and down a mountainside comes with its own mental hurdles and obstacles you have to get over too. So uh, I always find anytime there's unnecessary things kind of pinging at your brain it just drains that mental battery a little bit more than it would if it's not there. And having those accounted for can, can sometimes help you uh, pr perform a little bit better. Absolutely. But this is also a question of, of team. I'm, I'm definitely uh, aware how important uh, it is to, to have a good logistic. You have, uh, I have a partner who is coming with me. We are, we are around other mountain guides in Sherpas. 
we will be doing many rotations to see how the mountain is, where people are moving from one place to the other, uh, having communication to the other teams and everything. So it's it's not that that no, normally we see the, these pictures of so many people up there on the mountain. And uh, we think every day is like that. It's probably just one day in the entire season like that. So sometimes it's, it's exactly um, where you have to communicate with others and the important thing about everything is that when it comes you have to be ready and when it comes and you have to be ready means to be like 30 days before there uh, touching 8000 meters coming back and for example if people are uh, doing just the first rotations on camp one and camp two and not climbing further than that probably this is a good window for us because nobody's going to be on the upper section so this is something that we have to sit together with the team and check it what is absolutely um, different than all the other activities is this this is not an athletic mountain it's an absolutely altitude mountain so you have to focus the last three four months on altitude uh, sleeping on altitude breathing on altitude uh, living on altitude and everything so your body is absolutely covered with the altitude you can move uh, yeah, as fast as possible on that altitude because it's not a mountain that you can really run. I would love to run, but it's impossible. Yeah, just have to move as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speed is relative by the terrain for sure. <laughs> so <laughs> you've you've said a few things about just kind of like the base camp side of things and the time period when you get there and you actually start one of these projects and. It sounds like sometimes that's a pretty big span of time. So I know a lot of the endurance athletes listening to this are thinking like, well, how do you pick a spot where you end your peak training and start tapering for the event? Do you even get to taper or are you sort of tapering for a really long time when you're out there at base camp? How does that look differently when you're out there versus what you would be doing training before you kind of head out for it? And this is a this is a great question because it's uh, it's we cannot compare it with with trail running or with endurance running because as I as I've done it to start to plan the perfect day to be like hundred percent before the race and just be one or two days before the race just waiting until the race starts and and keep waiting and waiting and and then just perform as as good as you can. This is on mountaineering very difficult because uh, when you are returning from rotations or touching different altitudes and coming back to base camp, you are never, never going to recover 100%. Your body it gets weaker and weaker. You are not sleeping an entire night through. Uh, you are not eating as much as you would like to. You stand up in the morning and you say, I probably need another recovery day. And, and, and you think the next day is it going to be? And then you figure out that, that that next day is never never gonna come it's just a, a thing of attitude and okay i'm gonna do my best i think I, I feel better than yesterday and this is something different than 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 uh, competitive running it's uh you're never gonna find a day that your saturation is over 90s or that you have eaten uh, enough or that you have slept like 10 hours in a row uh, or your muscles feel perfectly because you are you are out there, you, you cannot run out there. And so you must, you are losing muscles. And uh, sometimes you just go out for, for an hour for a walk just to keep your muscles working. And uh, this is why you want to do it as fast as possible. That means uh, probably doing the acclimatization somewhere else and just arrive when the mountain is ready and just uh, try to, to be as motivated as possible to do it as fast as possible. Sounds crazy. But it's a fact that if you are doing uh, speed climbing, it's different than normally climbing a mountain. You 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 want to be as, as fit as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, crazy is the name of the game when you're doing what you're doing. So <laughs> I think we'll give you a pass there. Uh, you, you mentioned something that was interesting. So your oxygen saturation is below 90 when you're out there at base camp? Yeah, I was 31 days on 6,000 meters altitude and I never had more than 88. Wow. And uh, even sometimes sleeping five days in a row and, of course, waking up, uh, walking, but doing really uh, not much, just eating and being there. And uh, it still just uh, was, yeah, 
between 82 and 88. And as soon as we went up to camp two or camp three, sometimes it dropped down to 70, 68, 69, and then you have to recover again. So this is the point. You are never going to have 100%. And, and even, even close to 90s is, is impossible at that altitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Without I think, I think you want to be in like the, like optimally you want to be in like the mid nineties, I think from like a recovery standpoint and like, so you're in a position where recovery is already suboptimal. Uh, granted you have to deal with the, the environment that you're going to be in, but that I think like people hear those numbers and probably think like they'd be comatose at some of those, some of those ranges. So it's, it's fascinating to hear those numbers come, come from what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. If we compare it with, uh, yeah, of course, uh, even even COVID cases, uh, people, yeah, have to go to hospital in in lower nineties. You know, mm -hmm. like it, it, you cannot compare it. It's something absolutely different. And of course, um, I I saw it on the base campus. We had other people from the same expedition climbing with oxygen. They just they breath two or three times with oxygen, and they the the oxy the oximeter went up to 60 to 99 98 97 in just two or three breaths and this is uh amazing like uh this is just a, a thing of of oxygen and as soon as we return from base camp after the the record and then we we took the helicopter down to Kathmandu immediately as soon as you arrive in Kathmandu you are like <gasps> like coming out of the water and <laughs> this is impressive and you are sleepy and, and hungry and everything mm -hmm. yeah so is there like for the FKTs you're doing is it the expectation that you don't use oxygen then yeah absolutely FKTs are are done without oxygen because on the end using oxygen is is not doing the the real altitude of the mountain the, mm -hmm. the toughness of the mountain so in my consideration, of course, others can think differently, but in my consideration, all the FKTs have to be done the same on foot and, and secondly, without oxygen and without someone pulling you. Mm -hmm. And does that mean then you can't use oxygen in those days before you begin the attempt? So like when you're at base camp, you can't like top off on oxygen and then like the next morning head out for the project or something like that. You need to be removed from it from the day you land until you finish the project. You just mentioned it. You have to be absolutely away from oxygen all the expedition. Otherwise, it doesn't count as a no oxygen oxygen uh, oxygen expedition because, of course, you are tented. You are on next to the tent. You have oxygen, emergency oxygen. But on the end, it's it's cheating. If you want it to count, you got to do it without. That's incredible. Um, one last question about the FKT structuring and stuff like that. So, is the expectation sort of that you start in the same spot? and you get to the top of the mountain, however route you pick, or is there a very specific like path or track that you have to follow in order for it to count? Or does that vary from one to the other? Normally, normally, of course, you can choose your way up. You can choose where to go up. The point is that you start where tourists start to walk. Normally in a Kilimanjaro, for example, you start where the village ends, and then you climb the mountain, you put, uh, you put your hand on the summit and then you come back to the same place. This is a round trip FKT. And the round trip FKT, you can choose the route. For example, in, in, in uh, Kilimanjaro, there are six different ones and I chose the shortest one. And then on that shortest one, um, all the other FKT runners have tried the, the record. That means the records are made on that road. And um, on Makalu and all the other seven summits, I chose to do the normal road. So uh, there is uh, there is a time to beat and records are to be broken. So on the end, this is why I think that uh, it's important to put uh, the, the, the normal track so people can really try. And I hope there are going to be a lot of generations trying for it. And this is uh, yeah important for me. Excellent. Well, I, I love to hear that. I know like when you know, Killian went on his FKT surge a few years back and now you're on your FKT surge. It's been cool to hear you guys talk about how like, you know, you're, you're, you love chasing the records. It's a big passion, but ultimately you like to put a spotlight on this sport and, you know, hopefully highlight some things for future generations to come and uh, ultimately find out what humans are capable on this type of stuff. I mean, these are some extreme attempts and uh, it's, it's going to be fascinating to see like what you do for the sport when all is said and done in terms of bringing in some, some other excited folks, uh, to take a swing at this type of stuff. 
Yeah, I agree with you. In the end, this is a, a sport you wish everyone just good luck. You don't want anyone to have a, a bad day out there because a bad day can mean the death. So um, I'm, I'm good related with Kilian, for example, that uh, every time we see each other or he was he was even uh, riding me right now in Makalu, uh, wishing me good luck and he was like sending me all the good vibes. So in the end, it's a, a sport of gentlemen. I think it's like, it's mm -hmm. nice. It's um, Yeah, I think I would I would do the same for everyone, and I'm cheering for every single one who wants to try. It. There, there has been people who have said to me like, "Car, can you give me the track and the GPX and everything?" Of course, I, I would love that you could beat it, and I give you this and this advice, and yeah, just go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it almost becomes a team effort over years when you have like. Yeah, you know, some. Yeah, I'm sure some of the things you've done have been unique to what Killian did, and some of the things you used from learning from him and other people as well. And you know, ultimately, it puts us in a position to eventually whittle it down to what's the best way to do this, and kind of answer some questions that are probably almost impossible to answer in a lab. So, <laughs> you guys are doing the hard work out there. <laughs> um, oh yeah, absolutely, Zach. Yeah, so Carl, well, thank you so much. I want to be mindful of your time. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to follow the rest of your project and see what you do with your your, your remaining competitive years. And uh, I want to give you an opportunity to share where people can find you online, social media, website, that sort of stuff. Or if you have any books, documentaries, or anything like that you'd like to share as well as sponsors. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Zach. It was a really nice talking talking to you and uh, I hope we can yeah we can repeat this conversation and and do others in the near future uh, I definitely keep you posted what I'm gonna do in the following months and uh, you can find me in social media of course in, in Instagram for example carl.eglov uh, yes and, um, and and also in, in Facebook and Twitter in yeah I have my homepage carleglov.com And um, yeah, I would be just so glad to respond any questions that you have. And and I hope uh, in a near future to be in the States. I'm planning uh, probably one or two trips this year. So probably we can see each other in person. Yeah, that'd be excellent. Yeah, let me know when you're stateside. I would love to shake your hand in person and see the man who's summoning all these massive peaks. It'd be great. But um, until then, I will definitely put those links in the show notes for people want to follow along with your your adventures and everything that comes with it. Uh, they'll be able to find you there. Thank you so much, Zach. And thanks to everyone. <laughs> Take care. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Have a, have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks. If you are interested in adding some structure to your training program, I have some options that might interest you. Over on my website, ZachBitter.com, I have a wide range of ready-made plans that have options for beginners to advanced endurance athletes. I also have personalized plan options where I will cater a plan specific to the event you are preparing for and your personal schedule and training availability. You can also access a variety of add-on options from email collaboration to consultation calls to help guide you through your training and nutrition needs. You can access these with or without a formal plan. So head over to ZachBitter.com and let me know what you think.